Welcome, everyone. We are very much looking forward to this panel, Advancing Gender Equality Through Women-Led Climate Resilience. We have a very wonderful panelist group. And as everyone assembles and joins our Zoom, we will begin shortly. So welcome. We're just waiting a few more minutes. Hello from Toronto. Thanks for sharing. Please feel free as you join to shout out in the chat where you're calling in from and uh, welcome to all of you. We will be getting shortly. We have our panelists assembled, but just simply waiting for participants to go from one panel to another. Uh, delighted to have you all here. Welcome from Nigeria, I see some DC folks. Um, it should be quite a panel. It's such an honor to be part of CSW 66. Uh, such an incredible showing from the NGO forum and at Pathfinder, we're delighted to be part. My name is Barbara Mers. I lead our women-led climate resilience work at Pathfinder. Pathfinder, of course, has been walking the path with women for decades upon decades in the countries and communities where we work. And today we have an exciting panel where we're with our colleagues from both Bangladesh as well as Pakistan to talk about very specific research as well as on the ground projects. And in addition, looking forward, listening to the youth about how we continue to do this work. And I look forward to a robust conversation. So just so you know the run of show, we're going to start with some details from our colleague in Bangladesh, Dr. Rabi Uwohak. He will be giving us an oversight onto the work that we have on research with the University of Dhaka. From there, we will also hear from Dr. Tabinda Sarosh, our country director from Pakistan at Pathfinder, as well as our new colleague, and um, excellent youth advocate, Sadia Rahman. I really wanna welcome everyone. This will be an interactive and um, participatory discussion. We have the opportunity to hear from our esteemed panelists, and then we will go into an exchange within the panel. At the end, there's a Q&A. So to kick things off, the real focus for today is looking at the work and the research and the learning taking place at this exciting moment at the intersection of climate and health. As we have been doing this work for over a decade at Pathfinder, we've had so much to learn from colleagues on the ground, from communities where we have been listening and learning for all of this time. We're really realizing that climate change directly impacts the sexual and reproductive health and rights of communities across the areas where we work. We are delighted to be able to start to speak to this because we've noticed that this work only continues to grow. And it's growing because it's the reality and the backdrop for all of these communities. And remember, each community experiences climate exposures in different ways. So in parts of the world in which we work, there is climate-induced droughts. In other areas, it's frequency of storms, or perhaps it is extreme heat, of course, there are the floods that are so recurrent in Bangladesh, and that frequency and intensity is growing because the glacier melt that's happening in the Himalaya, as well as the ocean rise, which we have all come too well to know. In the IPCC report that was recently launched, it is clear and universally accepted in science that it is absolutely something that not only must we do to address with climate mitigation measures, which is to reduce the greenhouse gas, but importantly, climate adaptation. Climate adaptation is the ability to support and consider interventions that will be able to uh, support and back the leadership within communities to address the climate exposures that they face. We will begin this session today with a detailed look at what that, um, what we are learning from Dr. Rabiul Haq, 
who has done this research in conjunction with Pathfinder at the University of Dhaka. Professor Hawk is a professor and chairman of the Department of Population Sciences at University of Dhaka. He has his postgraduate degrees in sociology, as well as health and international development. His doctoral degree focused on healthcare of climate displaced populations. And he has continued to do that work in universities around the world, including Brown University in the US, the National University in Australia, Canberra, as well as Heidelberg University in Germany. I think every time I have looked at your research, I've learned something new, Dr. Hawk. I really appreciate the way in which it's grounded in day-to-day -day reality of women's and communities' lives. And with that, I know we have a big um, treat, so put on your listening ears uh, and over to you for a overview of your recent research. Thank you, uh, Barbara. I think we can start now, it's already time. Thank you for your nice introduction. I have already, I have some shares with some of you. I'll go for, can you hear me, Barbara? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. So, good morning to all of you, and for some of you, good afternoon. We have conducted this research with the financial and technical as, as well as financial support of Pathfinder International Bangladesh Country Office. The title of the research was Community Resilience to Climate Change and Disasters by Addressing Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. We have conducted this research in two districts, uh, basically uh, Gaibanda and Shatkhira. Both of these districts are highly disaster affected as well as highly vulnerable to displacement job found areas. The study team of this, uh, here is the study team. I was the lead uh, of this research. Research, then Professor Dr. Aminul Hayek and Professor Dr. Mainul Islam was helped me as a co-team leader. Um, if we see the study objectives, uh, basically, we have tried to capture the vulnerabilities related to the effects of disasters. Uh, you can see from the picture that disasters, uh, mainly the river bank erosion, uh, the, here you can see from the river bank erosion what types of effects Bangladesh experience almost each and every year. Understand the SRISR knowledge and source of learning of the rural women, particularly from their perspectives. And we have also tried to understand the maternal and new child health and FP situation, family planning situation in disaster affected areas. And then Bangladesh is a uh, disaster prone areas as well as Bangladesh also experience a high number of child marriages as well as. So we have tried to understand the prevalence of child marriages, particularly in disaster prone areas and gender-based violence during the disaster uh, situation. And then we have to learn about the linkage between disasters and SRAs, disaster as well as food security, learn about the preparedness of the health system to deliver healthcare services, particularly during the uh, disasters. Because in Bangladesh, the, uh, before I go for the next slides, I just need to inform that Bangladesh uh, experienced natural disasters almost every year. But Bangladesh is one of the least adaptive countries throughout the world. Bangladesh experienced two types of disasters. One we call sudden set of disasters, which are flash fire or cyclones like this, and as well as slow onset of uh, disaster. Based on these disasters, Bangladesh is categorized classified into two types. So mainland districts as well as southern coastal belt areas of Bangladesh. In our, our study basically conducted selected one district like Gaibanda is a mainland district of Bangladesh which mostly experienced river bank erosion and floods. On the other hand, Shatkira is a coastal belt district which experienced sudden flash floods as well as salinity and cyclones. If you see the overview of the total uh, findings of this research, we can find that the climate-induced displacement or climate-induced socioeconomic disadvantage of the households, it creates climate property trap for many of the households with recurrent displacement. Our study, we have, as well as 
threaten household which are minimally prepared to cope with the future disasters. As initially I have mentioned that Bangladesh is one of the climate variable country, vulnerable country, but the households in these countries, particularly who are living in the disaster and poor areas are highly, are not prepared at all to cope with the future disaster effects. Natural disaster also limits women's access to quality information according to our these findings, uh, the study findings. And this disaster also leads to increased child marriage, violence against women during disaster and limited use of SRAs related services, the existing services. And disasters affect all, but women suffered more due to household costs, food insecurity and trading of their own healthcare to adapt with the disaster, uh, disaster effects. Disaster also threaten current health system, which are not prepared to cope with the disaster effects. If you go specifically, we found that households in both districts are often affected by natural disasters. This figure basically shows that salinity of water is the highly frequent event for the coastal belt of Shakira district, coastal belt of Bangladesh. On the other hand, heavy rainfall and river bank erosion is particularly uh, focused on the Shatkira as well as Gaibanda districts. Water logging is particularly common for mainland uh, coastal belt areas. Earthquake is not so much severe high, but cyclone is only found in the Shatkira district, which is coastal belt, tidal wave also. But floods and river bank erosion, these two districts uh, events are basically happens in both areas, Shatkira as well as Gai Gaibanda. Gaibanda districts, so the prevalence of household experience of displacement and the prevalence of occurrence of natural disasters, particularly floods and riverbank erosion, are occurs almost every year in the country. Findings, displacement, and relocation caused. If we see, most of the respondents experience displacements within the last five years leading to significant relocation and displacement for that last years after a disaster. <clears throat> if we see that lifetimes of displacement within the last five years, average displacement is 1.5 times uh, for Gaibanda districts and 0.8 times for Shatkira districts. So it shows that three times and three year above time displacement, almost 13.4 percent of households have experienced displacement more than three times within the last five. So recurrent displacement is very common for the riverbank erosion prone districts like Shatkira, uh, sorry, Gaibanda and other mainland districts of Bangladesh. On the other hand, relocation cost last time displacement, see, it's around 64,682 taka, which means around um, 500, 600, 700, 800 dollar. So if it is 800 dollar, and if we consider that each household had experienced displacement more than three times within the last three, uh, couple of, uh, within the last five years, then it's very difficult for the households to minimize the cost because the average earning is less than $200 for maximum of the households in the disaster prone areas. So within the less than $200 or $150, uh, it's very difficult for them to minimize, uh, maintain their regular activities and household food security, ensure household food security. Then how the, the next question is how they manage the cost of these households displacement cost. We will see this one. Understanding the SRI situation, respondents in both districts have a limited understanding of SRIs because a little of education, poor financial condition, and lack of opportunity to think and converse about the SRIs. Additionally, if we see that respondents learn about the SRIs related information, mostly from the informal shows like friends or pharmacies, this way we need to clarify that pharmacies doesn't mean that are these pharmacists are difficult, different from the pharmacists as you understand in the Western country or developed countries. Here pharmacists are basically drug seller who, are, who doesn't have proper education about the medication system or other things. 
and government and NGOs help workers such as SKS, friendship and others help workers and textbook this uh, textbook is very uncommon for uh, or very less prevalent source of information for in most of the cases on the other hand women and girls have a very limited access to quality sr acr care because the cost is comparatively high for them if we consider their monthly income as well as monthly expenditure and disaster induced barriers such as floods and riverbank erosions during this time communication system has all broken during disaster times and the expenditure of movement from one place to another place also increased during that disaster times because only one option for them to move with boat but that boat is not available all the times and there are some also indirect costs for accessing here because during disasters households have to move because in our country you know uh, still it is very difficult for women in particular in rural areas to move for care from on their home to a uh, far away so someone has to accompany them so there is an indirect cost also uh, accessing to the quality healthcare services child marriage is another uh, significant event for bangladesh also the government of bangladesh has initiated a lot of activities to prevent child marriage or to reduce child marriage but still we are experiencing child marriage in our country. While child marriage is an existing phenomena in this country, during like natural disaster as well as during an emergency like COVID-19 situation, we experience a lot of child marriage, as well as limited access to the family planning activities. So child marriage is highly prevalent, like 73% of the household they have mentioned, respondent mentioned that they got married before age 18, which is significantly higher than the national level average uh, is at child marriage, which is around 65%. On the other hand, most of this child marriage happened uh, because child marriage is related with the economic, socioeconomic condition of the disaster fund households. Disaster is if disaster is one of the significant cause of socioeconomic impoverishment of the household. These socioeconomic disadvantages or impoverishment leads household to arrange marriage for their girls early, and so they have stopped their education. They have limited ex access to the. SRI's knowledge due to their child marriage, which is also directly as well as indirectly related with the disaster activities. On the other hand, modern sanitary napkins for menstrual hygiene practice is also very low in Bangladesh, only 10% in Daiwanda district and 15% in Shakira districts, which is pretty low compared to the national level figures. Because Sanitary napkins during disaster is not available. Most of the health facilities or most of the pharmacies have to relocate it. Uh, and the areas they are living in the disaster for time, the point areas, particularly during floods and riverbank erosion, they are busy with their household activities and to adapt with the natural uh, disasters effects. So in that case time, particularly women have to cut off their healthcare activities or they have to trade off their health needs with their regular activities. One of the respondents have mentioned that due to floods and way to other, I had to face problems of drying clothes used for menstruation and forced to live an unhygienic life for a long time. While majority of the respondents, it indicates that, so while majority of the respondents are using traditional methods to maintain their hygiene during menstruation period. This is also a burden during that time due to the low sunlight as well as there is no such place to dry their regular clothes. On the other hand, contraceptive use is 3.3 percentage points lower in Gaivanda compared to Shatya division, which is 64.9 percent. This figure is almost similar to the national level figure but we need to keep it in mind that the last national survey for Bangladesh health system, like uh, which was conducted under the National Institute of Population Research and Training, 
which is called BDSS, Bangladesh Demographic Health Survey data, which was conducted uh, five to seven years earlier. So this figure, if you compare this figure with the last report, then it's quite similar. But we need to consider that that report was conducted five to seven years earlier. On the other hand, one of the respondent had said that the limited access to the contraceptive prevalence is also linked with the disaster fund activities or disaster issues. Because during this period, the field level workers of our country have limited opportunities to visit their clients' home. On the other hand, so respondents also have a limited opportunity to visit the relocated household health center or their regular health centers. So they have to wait for the natural recovery. They have to wait until recovery of the uh, disaster effects. One of the respondents, uh, mother have mentioned that usually I take contraceptive from the service providers during home visits. Uh, before that, I need to mention that in Bangladesh health system delivery still in the rural level are delivered by the healthcare providers at home when they visited women at their home. But this time, these times I did not get any postnatal care or postpartum family planning services yet as they could not come to the COVID-19 due to COVID-19 pandemic, even I could not visit them at all. So we have conducted this field work during the COVID situation, I need to mention uh, also. Violence against women. The risk of violence against women increased during the disaster. This is the opinion of the respondent, as well as we have found uh, my previous research during my post uh, PhD degree, we have also found that child marriage uh, and violence against women increased during the natural disaster. And nearly half of the respondent experienced violence during the last disasters. Violence is a regular phenomenon for around 30% of the respondents, and violence is experienced at their mostly at their own home, mainly by their intimate persons. In some cases, we have found that they have experienced violence at shelter house also during the disasters, but the percentage or proportion is not so high. In general, respondents have a very limited role in family planning decision makings. So most of the cases, Husbands or by intimate partners, they have taken their decisions which method they will use and who will use the contraceptives. Even in many cases, women are also responsible to collect their or to manage their household, uh, manage their contraceptive methods. So male are very reluctant in that situation in terms of collecting and using contraceptive methods still in Bangladesh. We have tried to identify what are the reasons or why the such kind of violence is pretty high. Women are also have a perception. If you see the following figures uh, tables, it shows that women's perception about respondents of violence. Physical violence by husband is justified when women goes out without telling him or neglects the children, argues with him refuses to have sex with him or burns the food or does not obey the elders. This perception is a big problem for Bangladesh because this kind of perception when women perceive that husbands are justified for beating them, for these are the reasons, then this creates a problem. This perception is also related with their socioeconomic disadvantages situations of the population. When they are socioeconomically disadvantaged, when they grow up in a socioeconomically disadvantaged households, their perception is comparatively poor for those people who are grown up and who have socio better socioeconomic condition, better socioeconomic condition in terms of not only economic situation, but also in terms of the access to the education, access to the employment opportunities, as well as access to the better or quality information. Coping strategies to SRA. A significantly high proportion of the respondents did not receive any care for the SRA during the last session. Here, I also want to mention that uh, 
uh, one thing I forget to mention that violence against women. The qualitative data suggests that during the disasters, when any problems create, the mood of the intimate partner sometimes ups and downs. So when the husband's mood ups and downs or husbands are in tension or in bad situation due to disasters or economic losses or some sort of things, uh, during that time, wives or women are experienced violence more frequently because husbands often express their angriness or other things to their wife. And it seems that wives are responsible for such kind of natural disaster or such kind of losses of the household uh, property or assets. Our findings also identified that natural disaster is one of the important cause of mental stress as well as anxiety due to the household loss, property loss, as well as during the relocation of the houses from one place to another place, they experience a huge stress and anxiety. And they have to manage their relocation cost as well as they have to manage a new land, find a new land where they can move or where they can relocate it during that time. So often they need to trade off with their household properties to move from one place to another place. One of the uh, experience I need to share at this moment that like if you have a two cows and you have a need to move from one place to another place during that time, the poor people often trade off that with the boatman. I mean, the owner of the boat, you can take one of my cows and help me to move from this place to another place with another cow as well as my household properties. So this cost is pretty high for those particularly who have no cash at hand during disaster period. And most of the cases, the respondents, since they are very poor in terms of income as well as expenditures, they have to trade up with the fixed assets for relocation from one place to another place. So this type of activities basically, or this type of losses forces them to, or creates an environment of climate poverty trap for the households. Popping strategies of SRA ASR. A significantly high proportion of the respondents basically did not receive any care for their SRA ASR related problems during the last disaster due to again, high cost of services, long distance, because most of the times the households who are relocated from one place to another place, is, since they are socioeconomically determined, they again go in such places, find such places which is comparatively cheap, but that place are also vulnerable to experience natural disaster, maybe in the next year or a couple of years later. I have asked them why they move from that place to another disadvantaged places or vulnerable places. They have mentioned that we have no option to move from these places because I don't have enough capacity to move to better places compared to this place. Shyness or fear, this is another uh, problem for our women, particularly in rural areas, who doesn't want to talk about the SRA related issues with the healthcare providers or drug sellers or somebody else. Lack of service information is another issue. And high cost of transportation, as I have mentioned, that as well as the frequency of transportation during disaster is very low. If you live one side of the river, and if you need to cross the river, you have to wait maybe throughout the days, you have only one times or two times the boat have leaped from the place. And so you need to spend whole day for care. And this is the one of the disadvantages. This is also one of the causes of indirect high indirect cost. Poor perceptions as well as are responsible about the need of services. In most of in many cases, the respondent have mentioned that this will recover naturally, so it doesn't need to go to the healthcare providers. Disaster and disaster as stated business at household levels and broken communications are also responsible for such kind of prevention. Major sources. Of yep. 
Dr. Huck, this is fascinating and it's so good to be grounded in research. I know you have some policy recommendations that we'll get to in the panel. I just wanna make sure that we have the opportunity to really dive in with, as you point out, this high level climate poverty trap. I mean, I think that's such a great name for the work and I know you have a few additional slides but we'll be able to get to them shortly just to make okay. sure that we also have a chance to hear from our other panelists and then we'll dive back in. I want to point people to the chat as well. Our colleagues have actually just shared the link for the entire report that Docu University put out under the leadership of Robbie Ull. So you can see this entire work and read it at your leisure. I recommend it, it is excellent. And it goes to show, as you point out, recurrent di displacement, which is dis displacement due to climate, really gets very specific about the stressors. Everything that we in the community advocating for women's rights really think about is fundamental. Access to SRHR, hygiene, the levels of um, violence against women goes up in displacement, um, child marriage, obviously recurrent displacement, which in your research shows on average one, if not three times a year for these communities, very, very hard to navigate the climate poverty trap. And that's something that I think we need to take into account. It's not, these times are not business as usual. Um, so as we are grounded by research, which is one of the fundamental values at Pathfinder, really be, be grounded in the research. And this work has a lot of ideas for interventions. I wanna segue for a moment to our panelists, Dr. Tavinda Saroche who's actually been Pathfinder Country Director since 2016. Tabinda is joining us very early from Islamabad, and we are so grateful um, for you making time for this. I just wanna say by way of background, Tabinda not only is a seasoned practitioner in SRHR, but her technical leadership and management expertise. It's such a pleasure to be um, close colleagues to Binda. I'm always amazed by the work that you do. And folding in, we're just building on this panel. We're just gonna keep get, gaining momentum. Building on Raviul's presentation about the climate poverty trap in Bangladesh, I was wondering today if you could give us a flavor of what climate stressors are looking at from your perspective and the team's work in Pakistan. We'll get into discussion in a bit, but would love to hear your perspectives. Thank you so much, Barbara. I hope I'm audible to all the audience. A very good morning from Pakistan. Uh, we just heard Dr. Rabiol, and one can't help but wonder about the regional similarities and the context. Uh, I guess I would like to start my talk with the story of Ther Parker, where Pathfinder did its first project on women-led climate change resilience. Pathfinder has been leading the way in Pakistan on women-led climate change resilience programming and programming around the intersections of health, population, environment, and women empowerment. So starting my story with the story of Ther Parker and the women of Ther Parker based on Pathfinder's needs and gender assessment in the region. And my colleague Shailen will be running a few slides in the background. And these are photographs that Pathfinder team has been taking as we work in the field. So Thar Parker lies in the southeastern border of Pakistan with India and is dependent on agriculture and livestock for livelihood. In the past few decades, Thar Parker has increasingly been affected by droughts leading to poverty, poor health and well-being outcomes, including for mental health. Villages are scattered across the region with small pockets of villages existing. The terrain and lack of infrastructure cause mobility challenges and lack of access to health services. This also interrupts supply chain of many goods and commodities into the region. One of the key challenges in Thar Parker is the lack of access to clean water and limited water for sanitation. The houses provide basic shelter for the house, as you can see in the next slide. Uh, these are just standard structures to provide relief and shelter. 
there is no structure that supports sanitation and hygienic practices and open defecation is practiced around the houses, which further impacts health and well-being outcomes. It has to be considered that water is so scarce in these areas that personal needs and consumption has to be prioritized. So a daily ritual for women and girls is to collect water from the nearest well. In the next slide, you'll see women and girls grouping together to go and fetch water from the wells. On an average, women are able to collect 15 liters of water. It takes more than one to pull out this bucket of water. And due to water tables being too low, on average, are only able to do it once a day. The water is shared amongst all for drinking, cooking, cleaning, washing, for agriculture and animals. The last to get a share of this precious resource is the women of the village, despite them being the primary water bearers. Women are not only responsible for water collection, but all domestic chores, child rearing, and livestock care. After collecting water from the house, women can come back to feed their families, take care of their children, uh, serve breakfast to the women and send the, uh, to the men and send them off to the fields. Once household chores are completed, they bring the food to the men on the field. And while the men rest and eat, women tend to the agricultural and livestock care tasks at that moment. The women then come back to their homes, gather wood for the dinner, get the uh, dinner ready and take care of their children and then serve dinner. Despite their roles, women have no say in decision-making, do not decide on matters of health, education, expenses, etc. They're often subjected to domestic violence with many considering it a way of life. Hence, it's very much normalized. Early age marriage is a common practice in Thar Parker. The rate of education is very low and that combined with high poverty, climate change induced migrations have caused fears of violence amongst the communities. And they prefer to marry off their daughters young as a safety measure, as well as a reaction to the economic status or the economic changes in their lives. There's also evidence to suggest that marriage in exchange of dowry is a measure undertaken to obtain some security during harsh times. So now to some indicators, the average birth rate in Tharparkar is 4.6 per woman. 6.6% of the women use any method of family planning in the district and the unmet need is recorded at 44%. The maternal mortality ratio is 600 estimated by UNICEF compared to 180 for the rest of the country. Given the resource and security in the region, this is alarming. Maternal and child mortality rates in Tharparkar have been actually worsening, particularly child mortality rates and the nutritional status. Children are suffering from malnutrition, iron deficiency, and low birth weights. This has been linked to the growing issue of lack of nutrition, changes in nutritional patterns, lack of pregnancy care for women, general lack of health services. In these climate conditions, it is anticipated to worsen speedily. Early age marriage particularly will lead to early pregnancies, increased maternal and child health complications, and mortality and morbidity. Research has shown that young girls are likely to use contraception and do not have enough information and agency to exercise reproductive uh, control. With an increasing population and resource insecurity predication, it is imperative to respond immediately to the issues of Thar Parker. I would like to end my talk by talking about what Pathfinder has been doing and will be doing for the rest of our program in Pakistan. At the moment, we are in five districts in Sindh, including Tharparkar. 
recognizing that climate change is powerful and all encompassing and is to stay here unless we take immediate measures, it's going to threat every aspect of people's life. From their access to nutritious food and clean water to a woman's ability to earn an income and a girl's chance of staying in school. Pathfinder takes upon an approach that looks at climate adaptation and resilience through investing in programs that support women and girls agency, access to healthcare, access to wash services, livelihood opportunities, education, and participation in decision-making and local resource management. In Thar Parker, taking a socio-ecological approach, Pathfinder is employing a gender transformative approach to generate evidence for a proof of concept to combat the disproportionate impact of climate change on women and girls. Stakeholders within the community, community-based organizations, lady health workers, men, women, young people, and farming families would be provided information and skills to enhance and apply climate adaptive practices. Non-traditional stakeholders and policymakers are also being engaged to encourage advocacy and strengthen discourse on climate issues within the province. Last but not least, we are working with university students to create learning spaces based on human-centered design approach to, uh, to make sure that students and uh, you know, the custodians of our future are well equipped with knowledge, information, and advocacy skills to negotiate with the government to make sure that this damage is minimized at the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Tabinda. You're ending off so beautifully to pass the baton to our next panelist I'd like to introduce. But before I introduce Sadia, let me just say, as we are grounded in research by uh, Rob Ewell, it's so nice to be grounded in the real world work that Pathfinder has already started to do. You know, I love this notion of action learning we have at Pathfinder, which is really to listen to communities and the human-centered design. But as I said, you ended off by talking about the importance of university students and, and peers that can both learn and visit in communities. And our last panelist to introduce, Sadia Rahman, is Program Director of Light to Life and the Gate Institute Ingenuity Fund Awardee. So congratulations to you on that big award. It was so exciting to see streaming across my inbox that you received it because I am a firm believer in the work that you are leading. So being a youth activist in Bangladesh, you are leading this group, um, Light to Life, but not only is that an SRHR group, but you're really taking a whole person account and looking at the mental health issues as well as the climate justice issues, which are really big in the communities where you're working. I feel like I have to share with our, with our um, audience today that you've just come back from an event which you shared with us lasted until four in the morning with a mindfulness day for communities in Dhaka. And so the very fact that you woke up early to be with us um, and describe your work is a real um, privilege, honor, and joy. Thank you for doing that. And I wanna hand it over to you to hear a little bit more about this intersection of uh, the work that you're leading. Sadia. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, good morning, everyone, and wonderful presentation by Dr. Rabil. And I was hearing Dr. Taminda, and I was just interlinking uh, the situation with Bangladesh's scenario as well. So to your question, Barbara, that what motivated me to begin my work with SIHR and climate change? So my passion for working around SRHR, particularly youth family planning programs in Bangladesh, motivated me to begin uh, working on SIHR. And, and my commitment to improving global sexual and reproductive health was shaped by my experience as an youth activist in Bangladesh. I worked around uh, family planning programs for young people in Bangladesh and promoted SIHR through policy dialogues, creative mediums, leading youth focused initiatives. Uh, so throughout my journey, I successfully managed to engage in fruitful conversa conversations with different stakeholders like government, um, uh, civil society organizations, young people, and, and get a deeper understanding of how 
geography, um, culture, uh, community, and education all play a unique role in women's and youth access to health services, particularly uh, SRHR services. Um, my work with adolescent uh, reproductive health shows that youth uh, knowledge on this topic is uh, uh, sparse and, and often, I would say, uh, inaccurate um, and harmful to them being able to realize their full potential. And I also uh, explored during my course of work in Bangladesh that there are harsh realities during disasters. Women are the utmost victims of any disaster. And, and there are stories where a uh, 13 years old adolescent girl had to leave her school due to a disaster, how a family's economical condition uh, was compromised and she had to leave school and had to fetch water for her um, for her family or maybe the nutrition was compromised due to the disaster post disaster um, situation so these uh, stories actually um, impacted me uh, i'd say more deeply and and also, there are stories where pregnant women are also forced to bring water because the salinity in their areas is so much, they cannot consume their, their areas uh, drinking water they are supposed to have. And also, as, as Dr. Tabinda was saying, the gender-based violence, oh my God, during COVID, there are so many resources that the gender-based violence increased uh, tremendously in Bangladesh. And, and the mental health situation was also compromised. So these combined experiences I gained throughout the, these uh, formative years gave uh, the insight to help Light to Life, an organization I hold close to my heart. Uh, so with my amazing team, I am now working around SIHR mental health and climate justice in coastal belts of Bangladesh for the most climate vulnerable areas. And especially in mental health, we're engaging both male and female young people to support them throughout any post disaster. So I think these small steps, these small uh, stories, uh, these um, everyday challenges that we face on the ground and the uh, everyday changes that we make on the ground that actually impacts the uh, lives of women and girls on the ground and, and making changes uh, has uh, are my motivating factors to fight every day for youth SRH rise and climate justice. Yeah, I think over to Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. It's clear your passion is so authentic. And I want to dive in a level deeper. So we now have about a half an hour as panelists to dive into some of these questions we've teed up. So I invite Tabinda and Raviol to turn on your cameras as well. And Sadia, I thank you for sharing your motivation about this work. And I can you can really hear the realness about the issue hitting, that this is not something we can afford to um, wait to see if it is hitting people's lives or not. It's real, it's today, it's having an impact. So being responsive is, is part of all of our work and being responsive in a, in a, in a thoughtful way, um, but also being willing to innovate and be nimble in how we continue to learn and engage as we move along. So I want to take start this panel in a sort of um, taking the long view. I would ask that you know each of you are engaged in this work from different dimensions, be it from advocacy, from um, real world programming, from research. And all of you are seeing what is in fact a field being born. It is emerging and it is not yet completely formed, but it certainly will be. We know that climate and climate justice and this intersection with access to healthcare is a real and growing and intensifying topic. So my question to each of you, we'll just start with an easy one, is can you describe what would be your hope for this work over the next 10 years? So let's talk like sort of medium, maybe not long-term, but over the next 10 years, what do you really see as hope? And um, let's see, um, we can go in order. Rabiul, what do you feel 
about your responses given that you're seeing this research um, as you reflect on the results. And you are on mute, so just, yes. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, like I have found that the uh, rural population also have a very strong perception about their climate is changing. This is one of the positive, since they are understanding the climate is changing. And in many cases, I have found that uh, the respondents, since they are aware about the climate change, so they have taken mitigation approach as well as adaptation strategy, which is increasing, improving gradually. And in Bangladesh, the kinship, the social structure is very strong kinship-based society. So if there is a problem, in most of the cases, they took supports from each other so they can move very closely. And here I have a focused and I have a strong recommendation from the government side also to minimize the climate poverty trap, the government should have a special type of arrangement for, during that time. As well as our health system doesn't are uh, not prepared to cover the health uh, proper provide healthcare services for all of the population in the regular staff because you know that or some all of you mostly uh, if you see the report and you found that the health system uh, or health workforce is distributed uh, across the country eventually uh, in similar pattern but in the disaster prone areas sometimes they. Uh, experience very challenging situation during disaster due to uh, poor communication system and other things that areas we need to address as Sadia mentioned the mental health is a big issue during that time but still since young population are engaging with this process and they are now very much helpful so there is a big opportunity to engage them uh, in climate adaptation strategies, as well as we need to little bit help the rural population to engage them in the health activities. So that young population could minimize the prevalence of child marriage, as well as could minimize, could identify the needs of the disadvantaged population during disasters and distribute the healthcare services. They, they, that things has already been started in Bangladesh and I, I expect over the next 10, decade, 10 years or within the next one decade, this pattern will increase and it will be a social uh, uh, activities. I think the young population will be in, involved. And our university as well as our government has also now focusing, our parliament, our speaker has focused on that, mentioned that we need to engage the university graduates at, from the central level to the rural level. There are some graduates so we can engage them to adapt with the climate adaptation strategies so that they can help a lot. I think That's the great. positive things will come within the next decades. Thank you. Over to Barbara. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is there's there's certainly work that will emerge. So seeing the indicators like child marriage, but also really equalizing what's happening in more urban areas to those on the fringes. That really makes a lot of sense to me. And obviously technology plays a role here. Sadia, would you add to that and also share with us your vision? So, um... And Dr. Herbal already covered that what are the steps that could be made. And also, I think um, most important part is to address the community, to address the most affected people that which is now I would say it's young people because the uh, more than 50% of the population is young people now in Bangladesh. So whatever approach we are going to adopt is uh, should be focusing on young people and how to get them on board together so that we can uh, tackle this situation uh, together actually. And I would say uh, for many of us in Bangladesh, climate change was something that was coming in year, uh, coming after a few years, coming after decades, and this will happen. And lots of will happen and lots of future tenses were in the climate change issues where we started talking about it. But I would say it's present now. Climate change is it's, it's now now happening. And we need to, you know, take measures to address this on the on a, on a rapid response mechanism. Like we cannot wait for something to happen in future. So I think for commu uh, community engagement is the key for that and engaging uh, young people through creative medium, I would say, uh, be it any form of art, be it any form of music, 
be it uh, storytelling and also uh, so you know these are the forms we need to onboard in mainstream work of ours and also i would say um, other stakeholders like government need to because uh, they are the they are the powerful uh, authority in our country and what we can do is um, help them throughout the journey and take take guidance from them so it's really important that they adapt these uh, creative mediums through their work and they start to address uh, young people in the last mile, uh, mostly in the coastal belt in Bangladesh. So, you know, nobody is left behind and everyone is addressed of this situation. And uh, I would like to say that uh, what Pathfinder is doing is really appreciable and what, um, uh, and I also uh, like to mention the School of Impossible project that we are doing with, uh, with the support of Pathfinder that Life to Life will be implementing a project called uh, School of Impossible in four divisions of Bangladesh, uh, which are the coastal belts um, uh, divisions. So we'll be reaching out young people through creative mediums. Uh, and tell them the interlinkages between SRHR and climate change. So uh, in the community, as Dr. Rabil said, they know how they are being impacted by the climate change, but maybe we are still lagging behind that. They don't know the impact, the interlinkages between SRHR they are having in their lives. Maybe uh, um, adolescent girl doesn't realize that she is being married off at the age of 13 or 12 or 14 because of climate change, be because of a disaster that her, her family was impacted to. So also uh, people need to realize that the reproductive challenges that comes up with these disasters as well. So we'll be working to establish that interlinkages through uh, creative mediums of education, climate education and SRHR education. So I would like to call our all stakeholders that we start taking these small steps to, to reach out to youth in their way I know research is very important and also more than important is what is that, that interpreting those results of research in a youth friendly way, you know, oh. uh, you know, um, yes. youth, -friendly, youth friendly communication materials as well. So I would I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Abul and all of you uh, who are with us this panel that if you have resources, if you have research that that which is really limited uh, regarding climate change and SRHR issues, please convert them to your friendly materials as well, so we can disseminate them in in local levels easily, which is easily interpreted and and accepted. Your voice is coming through loud and clear, Sadia. Those stats, you know, half the population and growing is youth. Also, that this is not a future tense anymore. This is present. It is right now and it is urgent. I couldn't agree more. And yes, we really do have to do the work that we're doing together, which is to translate and move into action even as we are learning, I couldn't agree more, to be grounded in research and make sure that that doesn't stop us from being active in our engagement. So Tabinda would love to hear about your hopes for this area and as it's unfolding in Pakistan. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, you know, we are talking about contexts where women are already discriminated against. There is evidence to show that, you know, around gender parity in the indices, et cetera. So while Pathfinder leads the way on women-led climate change resilience, we also need to be cognizant that re resilience here is relevant and it's also dependent on many of the community linkages, the social cultural norms, you know, and hence the burden for resilience should not just fall on women's shoulders, but also on the shoulders of the state and the systems themselves. So not only do we need resilient families, resilient women, we also need resilient health systems that can, you know, that can brave through crises and that can brave through the climate change itself. Climate change is already arrived here. The indicators are already showing us that climate change is here and more and more we'll have to look towards local resource management. We'll have to look towards providing and facilitating people with enough services 
and agencies promoted through better social cultural norms to access these services and create a balance between the needs that are arising and the resources that we have in order to slow down or decelerate the damage that has already been done. So thank you so much. Mm. Such, a, such a richness in how you're describing this work. And I see in our chat, we also have a question from one of our um, audience members, how receptive and engaged to Binda, just because I know that you mentioned we're working in community with both men and women. So really curious, uh, this question about men and Tharpa Corps with Pathfinder initiatives, given there is a distinct social, cultural, economic status of the community as a whole. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, and very quickly, because I'm mindful of time, this is a very important question. We're living in a patriarchal society where decisions are made by men. And I think the hope here is, again, the young people, people which Sadia is working with, you know, and to start this change off early. So what we are doing in Thar Parker is to be, is through our, the work of our community-based organizations, dealing, uh, engaging with men, young boys, you know, and working with them to become agents of change within their community and advocates of women, advocates of reproductive health. In addition to that, the students that we are working with in the universities, you know, are a group of girls and boys who are mentating together to build learning labs, you know, and, and that is bringing in a male perspective into the products that we are making. Uh, you know, these products are being made in uh, collaboration collaboration with the community-based organizations. So they have the local knowledge, they have the male perspective, and they're actually focused on ch uh, change in a woman's life towards better health indicators. But I do think that this is a very important question and we need to keep going back to it and, and make sure that these changes are sustainable. And they can only be sustainable when we start young. So yes, thank you so much for that question. Yes. Um, this is an incredible discussion. We're really starting to see some of the synergies because it is a whole communities um, issue. As people in the climate world say, this is very much a systems issue. You cannot adjust just um, a carbon mitigation project without really understanding people's mindsets and the shifts. Sadia, a question back to you. You know, in our warm up for these panels, we had a couple chances to connect. And one of the things that really just sort of broke my heart when you shared it with me, but then I really have reflected how, what an important part of the story this is, is that the young people you're speaking to in last mile communities feel like the climate um, fight is done. Almost that we have lost the big game on, on being able to prevent because in their lives, they're witnessing the devastation. And so that must come with a toll on mental health. I'm wondering how you are sustaining people to be in the climate adaptive mindset to work with members of community for being um, solutions focused and or what role does mindfulness play? I know you do a lot of that with your organization. So I'm just curious because that feels like an important part of the story to really grieve and come to terms with our emotions around climate as impacting particularly youth, their entire future and potentially their family's future. So just any thoughts about this role of mental health, mindfulness, and yeah, really grieving what people are feeling is happening in their lives with climate. Yeah, exactly. So I was just sharing with you, I remember that uh, I, uh, that experience I shared with you that uh, I had a focus group discussion with a group of young people from, uh, it's, uh, called, it's a district called Shabkhira in Bangladesh, and which is one of the most impacted uh, areas, climate vulnerable areas of Bangladesh. So they're just saying that uh, when we are discussing about climate education and what climate change can uh, hamper, how climate change can uh, hamper their lives and what climate change can cause, they're just saying these are already uh, in our, exist in our lives and we don't find anything new in here. And uh, when, we, uh, when I ask them that what are your takes uh, of the future regarding climate change. And they just said so sadly that, uh, you know, we think that whatever you are talking about climate change or anything, it's already done and we are already suffering. 
so yeah so that the sort of disappointment i saw in their eyes was really heartbreaking but we cannot stop now uh, we we just cannot keep up so we need to uh, fuel our engine and and keep working and keep uh keep building resistance toward these mindsets and also the impacts of climate change especially in bangladesh i would say so what we are doing that we are working with government we are trying to reach as i said we're trying to reach the communities the young people and also the other series of stakeholders so for governments uh, we have um, different advocacy initi initiatives so uh, the fact with advocacy we need to uh, always be there with facts uh, in front of the governments we need to show them what's happening we need to give them ground insights that we have collected maybe or maybe connect through their works as well and also in communities i would like to say that mindfulness and mental health is a very great component uh, important component and it's high time that government uh, address this issue to all of their um, uh, interventions as a bit and also when we talk about SIHR particularly, we all we, maybe we only talk about health ministry in Bangladesh, maybe the two directories we have DGHS and DGFP. But I would say it should be a holistic approach. We should engage education ministry. We should engage the Ministry of uh, Women and Ch Children Affairs. So we should engage the youth ministry. We should engage the uh, all the other relevant ministries, and they have to work combinedly to to make impacts in every single uh, interventions of uh, of a woman's life on the ground. So uh, and mental health should be uh, a, uh, should be included in the main curriculum of, of Bangladesh in the textbook curriculum maybe and maybe uh, there should be mandatory uh, psychosocial counselors in schools who will uh, you know talk regularly with these sort of young people in communities who are being the victim of climate change or, or other. SIHR issues. So this needs to be in place. And also uh, we are practicing mindfulness through art. In Life to Life, what we do that we have a uh, intervention called art therapy. So we have different therapies where people can express their views, their griefs, their thoughts through art. No need to be a Picasso for this. We just hand them colors and brushes and tell them paint your own ideas and, and your mind. And there are, uh, there are incidents through our uh, art therapy, people has expressed their wildest uh, uh, imaginations regarding climate change, what solutions could be done. And also we have uh, came to know the realities they're also going through. And, and we have storytelling, we have songs, we have poetries through uh, which uh, community, uh, young people from a very rural area can express his views through these creative mediums. So mindfulness is something that we need to promote from institutions to family. And throughout this journey, we need to uh, add parents as well, because from in adolescent age, uh, adolescents go through a lot and parents sometimes cannot understand what they're going through. So mindfulness is something we need to practice uh, in textbooks, in, in policy making areas, there should be policies in place in institutions that address this issue. And, and it's, a, it's also an emergency, I'd say, mental health is an emergency as well, like COVID. So in COVID, how uh, governments uh, reacted immediately, took measures for mental health, for climate change and SIJ, we need to take immediate measures as well. You are uh, articulate spokeswoman, Sadia, for these causes. And I'm really seeing um, the support on, on the chat as well. Let me say, I personally would love to see some samples of the artwork. That sounds like a really good way to engage and also a way to have a create a reflective space, which is what the arts and culture have been about for you know time memorial. So that's fantastic. Well, we're getting more questions. Facebook page in uh, of Life to Life. 
So you just have to search life to life and you can go through all the pictures and murals we had in our last festival for change in Cox's Bazaar. So we had San Mandela in beach, we had murals, we had art therapies. So it's all in there. Please go and check it. <laughs> Wonderful. And Cox's Bazaar, as you all know, is the area in Bangladesh where a lot of refugees are coming over and have been for a while from Myanmar. So that area also has additional resource pressures. And we at Pathfinder have been working in that area with SRHR for some time, but I'm definitely going to check out the arts work, especially San Mandala from that area. Thanks, Sadia. Uh, Robbie, well, back to you. We're getting questions as well from audience. One of them goes to policy. And in particular, there is, of course, the intergovernmental framework, the what's called the Conference of the Parties, COP. We're now up to COP 27. So COP 26 was last November. I was able to attend in the conversation about adaptation now, climate adaptation is real. The question is, what do we hope to accomplish in terms of influencing policymakers as we head into COP 27? So I'd ask you, Rabiul, how can your research be translated? Sadia has asked us for research being translated to youth, and I love that. But as well, we need to work at those levels, as you said, across ministries. So um, that kind of intersectional uh, translation into ministries across the spectrum. Rabiul, what are some of your key policy recommendations based on your research um, to those who are attending COP27? Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I would like to inform that in our, uh, like Bangladesh, the country has run with this five-year plans. Last couple of years, last couple of uh, two decades back, gender was gender discrimination or variation was a big challenge in Bangladesh. In that time, Bangladesh government has put gender as a cross-cutting issue throughout the ministry and added into our five-year plans. That's why now the situation is much more better compared to the previous years. Similarly, the Bangladesh government has uh, prioritized climate change as a big threat for Bangladesh socioeconomic development as well as for assisting the AIDS disease and Delta Plan action that targets. <clears throat> Considering this, the Bangladesh government has already placed climate change as a cross-cutting issue in the seven five-year plans and the next couple, uh, five year plans, which is eight five year plans. Since this is a cross cutting issue now, I think the government has already started to place this one with the interministerial activities. Like similarly, our study also recommended that we can, we have an opportunity since like health sector alone is not uh, for health sector staff, it's very difficult alone to provide uh, to identify the needs of the disaster affected population uh, health needs as well as other needs. So the recommendation is if we have an opportunity, now we are talking to integrate the health system with the disaster management system. See, if we can uh, integrate one service with the like, relief system. So if we integrate one ministry with other ministry and one program with another program, so they can help each other to identify the needs as well as to provide the services during an emergency situation. In line with Sadia, I would like uh, to add one thing as well as I would like to thank Pathfinder. Because you know, in Bangladesh, as well as for other countries, some of the disasters are highly media, highly- um, They're very publicized, yes. Publicized mm -hmm. by media. Particularly yes. in Bangladesh, the coastal belt of these areas is highly publicized yes. in the media. But we need to keep in mind that the coastal wave affected you with the disasters like after five years or 10 years, once in a 10 years or once in a five years, but the effect is very fast. On the other hand, the mainland district, there are 24 mainland districts in our country whose districts are affected each and every year by severe floods and large number of riverbank erosion, which is the biggest cause of sustained huge displaced population displacement. But this part of the series, since this is a slow onset of disasters, and since this is occurring almost each and every year, that part are not publicized in the media. This is, we are as a policymaker, as well as we are as an academician, we are, we are talking about this. Now we are last time meeting, you know, the parliament members, we have mentioned that we need to address the slow onset of disaster. Otherwise, the flow of internal migration from rural areas to urban areas, we can't stop it. 
we are talking about migration, but we can't stop it without addressing their or without increasing their adaptation strategies. If we need to increase the adaptation strategies, we need to import local population or community people. Definitely, we need also include the women population in our mental health issue. When health, the basic health is neglected or people need to minimize to the needs of the basic health, mental health is definitely will be neglected. So we need to combine both the regular healthcare needs activities as well as mental health services. And I am strongly agree with Sadia that as a demographer, I know that Bangladesh is the most important aspects of Bangladesh and the major strength of Bangladesh, we have a large number of young population. The supply of that young population will continue another 20 to 30 years. So we can actively involve them. And if there is, since the process has already been started, with the Bangladesh government, I hope we will be success to address these issues and SRIs are, will be the key point in the central policy, of course, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you. It actually goes to show for me that Bangladesh has a real expertise in responding to disasters because there have been floods for so many, so many decades. And although they are increasing in frequency, I really feel like we have a lot to learn on how progressive some of the policies have been. There's a ways to go, but I do feel like there's a good amount to learn from disaster relief and recovery from the way Bangladesh has worked. Yes, Ravi. I would like to just one thing with, uh, regarding uh, your comments, Rekhunsa. Bangladesh is recognized as a good, uh, uh, the disaster management activities is recognized globally because one of the key aspects of our country is that the kinship, Bangladesh is a kinship-based society. Uh, yes. So if someone of our, uh, since the kinship basis, since this is a kinship basis, the social network is very strong within the country populations. That's why if someone is in a danger situation, like in my research, and if somebody goes in detail, they will find that who will help during an emergency situation. The respondent are clear, particularly mentioned that my neighbors are the most important aspects than my relatives, yes. then the government activities. Are. So yes. if you see the pillars of these activities, and th this is the strength of our country also. Thank you. We've learned that. Yeah, we've learned that. I feel like COVID has also hastened all of us to learn who is in our neighborhood. You know, so many stories where people have actually realized their lives are not just abstract. They really relate to who and where we live. And those opportunities for strengthening, I think, is real and should not be undermined, but should really be looked at as an asset of what we're doing and what we're learning globally. Um, we're turning our conversation now to folks who are putting Q&A into. So please, anyone in our lovely um, attendees, feel free to start to pitch in some questions to the um, to the chat or the q and I've been taking a few from the chat, but let me just quickly address these few um, to the panelists. Over to you. The first is, is there a movement to increase post-disaster therapy and mental health services for men to reduce violence against women? And actually, Tabinda, I'd love to hear your perspective on um, what kind of, because we know you've worked a lot with gender transformative work, and I'm just curious if you know of or have heard of programs working in this area, um, really looking at whether or not mental health support in any way reduces the uptick that we've seen in violence against women. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I think this is such an important question because, you know, uh, mental health issues are now being reported more and more in Thar Parker. In fact, last year we did a review of all the news that came out from Thar Parker and the cases of suicides had gone, uh, you know, very um, high. And, and, and on a deeper look, the reason behind the suicides was often cited as violence, you know, fear of economic hardships, especially women who were not able to provide food for their children and men too, frankly. Um, now, mental health is a, is, is a new area that is very slowly being destigmatized in Pakistan. The stigma around mental health and its rela relationship, with, especially with masculine identities 
is very tricky uh, because it is considered a sign of weakness. Men are decision makers and with mental health, many people assume that this would also lead to indecisiveness, lack of control, lack of authority within a household. So actually uh, revealing or talking about mental health is not the norm, unfortunately, even in more urban areas. However, we are seeing more and more programming coming up, which is now directly and indirectly addressing mental health. And in our programs, this, this comes through through the human-centered design approach, because when we work with, uh, with people taking a human-centered design approach, students, community members, you know, they tend to talk about a lot of issues that they otherwise would not talk about or if they were labeled as mental health issues. So I think right now uh, we are at a point in Tharbarkar where we need to be very careful as we move into the community and understanding what the issues are uh, and, 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 and speaking to the people in a language that they understand and in which they're not afraid to talk about the taboos, you know, and unfortunately mental health does carry that taboo. Having said that, in the urban hubs of the country, uh, you know, mindful art therapy is being introduced. In another project for Pakistan, we also did mindful art therapy using mandalas and everything for providers, where we had connected a bunch of private providers together to motivate them to reduce their bias against young people for contraception. This was for our project Beyond Bias. And we are trying to take this learning from the, this project, but this is an urban context. And we have to remember that Thar Parker is a different context and, and, and so many other pressing health issues, you know, uh, compete for prioritization in this area. So I hope that answers the question of my audience. It's, it's really helpful. And I, I see the other panelists head nodding, particularly Sadia, who, you know, sometimes the way that we speak about topics, context is everything. And so understanding how you can actually access, which goes to the next question on the chat, which is Sadia, what in your experience have you seen as the most impactful mediums to speak to youth and girls that make an impact? I'm really curious about your answer to this, because I think there has been, Rabiol had mentioned something about communications, I'm imagining technology. I'm really see, I'm wondering what in your experience makes the most impact, what lands? So in Bangladesh, mostly uh, young girls are, has a few taboos around be it SRH or mental health, because uh, in mental health, we only understand two terms, sane and insane. There's nothing in between. So, so, uh, and if you're seeking mental health um, um, services, there must be you people tag it as as uh, insane or or mentally ill people. So it's really stigmatized. So for us, we had uh, started an um, helpline, twenty four seven helpline, where counselors were there, and anyone could just call and and share uh, their mental health state or they if they had anything to share about. So people uh, had, had an opportunity to vent uh, throughout that uh, um, helpline. But uh, due to fund uh, limitation, we had to um, cut that helpline down. But till now, it's one of our successful interventions that we had, in, uh, we had a uh, website um, and, and there is a 24 seven hotline where people could reach us. So that also, uh, you know, uh, enlightened us that what is, uh, there's a huge market, uh, there's a huge demand, there's a huge need uh, of information and, and having someone just to listen. So sometimes um, uh, being, being listened uh, is, is sort of the biggest therapy a people need the biggest support a person needs so yeah i think in terms of young girls it's it's at using the technology and and get them heard was one of the most successful techniques it's really interesting so it's not necessarily the megaphone using technology yes but it's actually to welcome 
people's observations, thoughts, maybe requests for help, whatever it is, to be able to be a two-way communication. That makes a lot of sense. Well, we are nearing the end of our panel time. And so I wanna actually just circle back with each panelist with one overarching question before we conclude the panel. And this one actually just leads to the audience themselves. You know, we are really, really curious about how we as audience members in coming from many different backgrounds, you know, there are folks here who are stakeholders, including um, donors, practitioners, researchers, advocates, um, you name it. There's a diverse group that comes to the CSW and how fortunate we are that there's so much expertise about gender transformative work and really the status of women. I'm very grateful for this group and I wanna be kind to our um, stakeholders because often the panel, um, you, people walk away wondering, but what can I do? So I'm curious if you could give one message that this audience could keep in mind as they walk away with this connection between SRHR and climate, and how can they really, in their own lives, advance some of these solutions that we've touched on today? We'll go in the order that we um, heard your presentation. So, Rabiul, a thought and a message to conclude for our audience members at this nexus of SRHR and climate. The first thing I will say, the message should be, as a human being, I will respect the need of women. Like, if I start it from my home, the community will be addressed, the country will be addressed once in a time. So as a human being, every uh, man should be think that the need of women are equal to the need of men. So we should res start to respect women's need. The, SRA is related needs. If you keep it in mind, and if we uh, create awareness about this by using social media and other media, I think that message could help a lot. I couldn't agree more, and I'm sure this audience is behind you. I can absolutely see that. Um, Tabinda, a message that you would have. Thank you so much. I think as a programmer, my message is towards programming and interventions. And I think more than ever, climate change programming is teaching us that we cannot be programming in silos. Women's agency, women's health is not a siloed issue. It's connected to education. It's connected to climate change. It's connected to her status in the society. And I think our interventions need to take this all in account and gender transformative approaches that not only are, you know, that not only engage with communities, but also with systems and not just health systems, systems for the overall social uplifting of the society, women development department, the commissions on the status of women need to be involved. Uh, the transport department needs to be involved. The education uh, department needs to be involved. So intersectional programming, programming on the intersection of all these areas is the future if we are to make any impact. Thank you so much. I love these, they're just so helpful um, and build so beautifully upon each other. Really, we cannot be programming in silos. We keep on learning that lesson. And though sometimes it may feel challenging, the results are what we should be looking at. Yeah. Sadia, we would love to offer the last word on this messaging um, to you. What would be your wish for audience members to take away? So I start uh, saying that without achieving autonomy over our bodies, and we cannot achieve autonomy over our lives. And to achieve autonomy and give autonomy to women and achieve SDGs, we need to address uh, young women's lives on the ground. And we need to have interventions and wonderful works from Dr. Rabiu and Dr. Tavinda is doing. I'm showing the participants as well. We need to keep that going. And if uh, in the participants you are from government, I would say, uh, I'd say uh, work with us as, the, as equal partners. I'm, I'm talking about young, young partners. If you're from donors, uh, I would say uh, invest in us 
and if you are, you are from any civil society organization or NGO, I'd say uh, include us as equal partners in your work so we can contribute together. And also it's been more than 25 years of ICPD and uh, we haven't seen any significant uh, uh, significant achievement around uh, SRHR of adolescents and young women. So uh, I would say that maybe one of the reasons could be that we young people haven't been included as equal partners. So uh, it's not like you are uh, 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 being successful without us anyway. <laughs> so why not uh, include us uh, as equal partners? That's my last takeaway from this. Like ending on that, a question, why not? Um, we could all be doing this work in much more collaborative partnership, walking side by side. Sadia, such a pleasure to have you and your voice. To Binda, always grateful for your colleagueship at Pathfinder and everything you lead. It is totally inspirational. And Raviul, you and your team on the research that you've produced is absolutely astounding. You have really laid the groundwork. So Grounded in great research, you know, expanding, daring, and intersectional programming, and really amplifying youth advocacy as core to this work is what this panel is about. And so thank you to all of you. I see some great applause popping up in the chat to each of you. And so though we can't hear it on Zoom, um, really, really excellent. Thank you very much. And Pathfinder, We'll be following up. Follow us on social media. We have articles to dive in. There's this research link. We also, of course, continue to do this programming. We will be speaking, um, continuing to do great innovative programming. So to everyone who actually organized this panel on behalf of my Pathfinder colleagues, thank you. And to CSW, may this be a successful overall conference. So grateful for the work that you all do. Thank you for having us. All the best. Thank Bye you. Now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.